Good evening, everyone. My name is Annie Black. I am the Director of Programs and Volunteers at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's History Highlights program on Holocaust Denial. I'd like to start by thanking our community partners for this program, Chai Dallas, Congregation Sheriff Israel, Legacy Senior Communities, Mosaic Family Services, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. Thank you all so much for your support as always. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our museum members and board members joining us this evening. Thank you for your continued support of the museum and our programs. We will leave time for questions at the end of tonight's program. So if you wanna take just a moment to locate the Q&A button on your screen, it should be at the bottom. If you are on a computer, it might be at the top if you are on a tablet or mobile device. But at any time during the program, please feel free to use that Q&A button to type out and submit your questions. So it is now my pleasure to turn things over to our speakers for tonight, our own Dr. Sarah A. Bosch Jacobson, Barbara Rabin, Chief Education Officer, and Dr. Charlotte DeCoster, Ackerman Family Director of Education. Sarah and Charlotte. Hi, good evening. Um, and good evening again, Charlotte. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, this evening's talk is going to be about Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion. We're going to dip into just a few examples of this. It's a fairly, uh, unfortunately, um, complex uh, uh, field, if you can call it that, with a, with a long history. Um, but we'll start um, with uh, a definition of Holocaust denial and then some examples of it. Then um, uh, Dr. DeCosta will, will follow up on that um, and also begin to talk about Holocaust distortion. Uh, and then we'll end, I hope, with enough time for uh, questions and answers that you might have about this topic. Charlotte, can you start the... Ah, there we go. So um, before we uh, talk about the two uh, items that are illustrated on this first slide, I wanted to give you a few quick definitions of Holocaust denial. And the reason I say a few is because there's all kinds of definitions out there. And I, I think I've picked three of the most uh, salient ones. So the first definition comes from the Simon Wiesenthal Museum of Tolerance that's based in Los Angeles. And they say that Holocaust denial, also known as Holocaust revisionism, which, which uh, Dr. Koster will talk about later uh, in our presentation, uh, is the attempt to deny or trivialize the atrocities committed by Nazi Germany against Jews and others during World War II. It's a pretty, succinct definition and a pretty pretty uh, easy to follow one. The next definition I wanted to, to use is a definition that uh, was put out by the Anti-Defamation League. And the ADL does a lot more uh, in talking about the background and overview of Holocaust denial. But again, their definition is a pretty, is a pretty short one. Holocaust denial is a propaganda movement active in the United States Canada and Western Europe, which seeks to deny the reality of the Nazi regime's systematic murder of 6 million Jews in Europe during World War II. And they actually give examples of what they mean by Holocaust denial. And I'm not, and there's a lot of material around this, but I'm just going to read uh, the, the, the five short examples that they give. Uh, the, the first example uh, is a whole school of thought and literature that claims that the Holocaust did not occur because there was no single master plan for Jewish annihilation. This is the old smoking gun argument. If you can't find a smoking gun, then, then anything that happened has no proof to it having existed. The next thing they, they uh, give as an example is that there were no gas chambers used for mass murder at Auschwitz and other camps. This is a, an old chestnut that gets brought up again and again and again. The third is that Holocaust scholars rely on the testimony of survivors because there is no objective documentation proving the Nazi genocide. That is demonstrably false, but that is certainly something that circulates. The fourth is that there was no net loss of Jewish lives between 1941 and 45. In other words, the Holocaust didn't occur statistically. The Jewish population of Europe simply didn't change. 
And then the fifth example that they give is that the Nuremberg trials were a farce of justice staged specifically for the benefit of the Jews. And again, that's a, a bit more of an involved definition of Holocaust denial than the first. And then the third definition I'll give you, and, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just give you the nuggets from this, is from the um, International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Authority, the IHRA, which is the intergovernmental organization whose definition of anti-Semitism and examples we use at the museum. It is the definition that has been adopted by the US State Department, by the American government, and by 30 plus governments around the world. And they define Holocaust denial as discourse and propaganda that deny the historical reality and extent of the extermination of the Jews by the Nazis and their accomplices. Holocaust denial refers specifically to any attempt to claim that the Holocaust Shoah did not take place. And then they, they give examples of what they mean. Amongst other things, they take it beyond what the ADL spoke about. They add a form of Holocaust denial to include blaming the Jews for either exaggerating or creating the Shoah for political or financial gain. And uh, the goal being to make the Jews culpable in what happened and anti-Semitism legitimate again, because the Jews have, have once again, being Jews, they've exaggerated things. Um, there, there's more, but, but those are the three major definitions I wanted to give to start with, because Holocaust denial is something that began while the Holocaust was occurring and then continued afterward. And as those of you who have seen some of our earlier presentations, or visited our 10 stages of genocide gallery know the 10th stage of um, genocide is denial. Now, you'll also know that those stages don't necessarily go one through 10, they're stages that exist simultaneously with each other, but Dr. Greg Stanton, who created this, this, this working definition, says that when you hear denial, when they start to deny, you know, move along, there's nothing to see here, we weren't involved in any killings or anything like that, he said that that's frequently a very good indicator that a genocide has, in fact, taken place. So let's talk about some of the denial that began during the Nazi uh, regime and during the Holocaust. The first thing that you have on this slide here is a small uh, facsimile of the Corhair report. And the Corhair report was a very interesting report. It was put together by Dr. Richard Corhair, who was a German statistician who worked for various Nazi functionaries and was charged in 1943 by uh, Heinrich Himmler with putting together a report on the number of Jews in German controlled territories who had been uh, killed between 1939 and 1943. However, the euphemisms had already begun. So the report, and I'm translating the title into English, the report was Final Solution to the Jewish Question. So there's no mention of death. They don't, you don't know what, a, what, what is the question we're asking about the Jews. I mean, it's, it's all deliberately euphemistic. The entire report, as I said, was 16 pages long. Uh, and it talked about Jews, uh, 1.274 million Jews in the area of um, the uh, general government, uh, which is uh, the, the section of Poland that was that was controlled by the Nazis, one of the sections of Poland. They talk about Jews being processed. There's no mention of, of, of murder or starvation or any of these kinds of things. Interestingly, although the report was short and, and, and to the point, Himmler asked for a summary of the report, a six and a half page summary to be created, which came out uh, in March of 43. And what that uh, report did, amongst other things, is it changed the name of the euphemism that was used for killing Jews from special treatment, and again, I'm translating from the German, to being processed. So that was a deliberate attempt to make it even more vague. 
interestingly also about this report is that the summary of this report was ultimately in later 43 delivered to Adolf Hitler. And the reason I mentioned that is because some of the individuals we're going to talk about later contend that Hitler had no idea that the Holocaust was going on. He had no hand in it. He had no connection to it. So this is one example of Nazi denial, efforts to deliberately both record for themselves what's going on, but at the same time, cover it up so that if these documents hit the outside world, they, they, they can deny. That's the first part of this slide. The second part of this slide relates to uh, Aktion 1005 or um, Operation 1005, which was a campaign to hide the mass killings of Jews in the East between June of 1942 and late 1944. And by that, I don't mean that the killings occurred between June of 42 and, and, and late 44. The killings actually started in the East on June 22nd, 1941 with Operation Barbarossa and the invasion of the Soviet Union. However, beginning in 1942, a decision was made by Reinhard Heydrich and some other Nazi functionaries that they had to hide what they had done in these killings in mass graves across the East and also in the killings in the three Operation Reinhardt camp, uh, death camps. So uh, Sobibor, Treblinka and Belzic, none of which had crematoria. And so a um, group of Sonderkommando, actually uh, several groups of Sonderkommando, mostly staffed by Jews, were put together. These, and a Sonderkommando was just basically a special operations group. The special operations group were sent first to Chelmno, uh, which was the first death camp that was brought online in December of 1941. So even, even before the Vanze conference, it's operating. And they go there and they dig up the mass graves that are there, and they have to figure out a way to get rid of the bodies, to get rid of the evidence. Um, they try incendiary devices at first, that's a mess, it sets the nearby woods on fire, it doesn't do what they need to do. Very quickly under Paul Blobel, who, who, who uh, is the SS official in charge of this operation, they discover that they have to create essentially a funeral pyre, railroad ties bodies, railroad ties, douse it with a, a, a flammable material, set it on fire, and then once the bodies and the um, uh, bone have burned down as much as possible, they use either backhoes or threshing material to, to break up the rest of the ash, bury it, and, and they're ready to go. The Zonderkommando, who, who were the actual people who, who did the unburying of the graves, the burning of the bodies, and the, the crushing of the bone, and you see some Zonderkommando members standing here by one of these crushing machines, as I said before, were mostly Jews, and so they were executed after this was done. Um, just to give you a sense of how extensive this was, between 42 and 43, this was done at Belzic, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Auschwitz even, because Auschwitz, although it had crematoria, was killing so many people it couldn't, with its own crematoria, keep up with the number of bodies, and so some had been buried in mass pits. The Germans then be, moved on to exhuming bodies and doing these mass burnings in the Soviet Union and in Poland, Belarusia, the Baltic countries as well. Um, and in the Baltics, they also did this to the bodies of Soviet POWs whom they had, whom they had executed. The only way that we found out about this form of denial of saying this never happened and we never did this was that the Soviets, once they began to pick up momentum and move westward and, and force the Germans in front of them back into Germany proper, they overran some of the Zonderkommando units that were involved in Action 1005. And so that's how we know because they actually came upon these pyres and these open graves that had not yet been fully hidden. Um, so this is one set of, of um, examples of, of how the Nazis did this. Um, there, are, there are many other things that they did. A lot of it was done, as I said, through, through linguistic uh, machinations so you hide what you do. Okay, Charlotte, can we have uh, the next slide, please? Okay, 
what we wanted to do with uh, talking about David Irving, and I will do this briefly because there's still quite a bit of material to cover and I don't want to cut into, into Charlotte's time, is to bring this into the current era because Holocaust denial begins with the Nazis, but it doesn't end with the Nazis and the opening of the death camps and the Nuremberg trials and the mountains of evidence that are that are mustered and the uh, to 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 show the world that this had happened. So David Irving is one of a whole series of Holocaust deniers who emerge in uh, the post war period. And Irving himself is an interesting fellow. Uh, he's born in 38 and he was a, an amateur historian. So he never, he's, he's British, he never graduated uh, university, but he had a, an extremely, and I say had not because he's dead, but because he's not particularly active at this point because he's been discredited. He had a gift for writing popular histories about the Third Reich and the Nazis. He claimed to have done extensive, serious scholarly research in writing what he wrote. And he managed to make actually millions of pounds in doing, in doing these publications. He was, in fact, a Holocaust denier. And ultimately, what happened was that in 1994, Deborah Lipstadt, the academic from Emory University, who you probably know through the movie Denial, uh, which is about the trial we're going to talk about very, very briefly, wrote about him in her 1994 book, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, that he was a Holocaust denier. And so what he did was he brought suit against her in a British court of law, British court of law, because the publisher of her book was Penguin Books headquartered in Britain. And it's an interesting suit because in American uh, libel or defamation law, I, as the plaintiff, as the one who's bringing suit, have to prove that I have been wronged. In British law, it's different the person who is being accused, the defendant, has to prove affirmatively that what they said was in fact the truth. And remember that Lipstadt was not well known. She was a Jewish academic from, from Emory University. You know, she had no huge amounts of money or, or huge um, uh, popular awareness. You know, nobody knew who, who she was outside of, you know, some academic circles. And she stood by this guy. And what he's attempting to do is to shut her down. And if he does this, he effectively stops any publications coming out of the UK that say, these people are denying the Holocaust. These people are lying about what happened. He can essentially, essentially chill all study of, of Holocaust denial and, and, and in many ways of, of, of the Holocaust itself. And so she, Lipstadt, decides to fight this in court. And it's a long story, but she ends up, uh, through her legal team, recruiting Richard J. Evans, who is a famous Holocaust historian on his own, to go back and recreate all of Irving's research. And what Evans does, and you can, you can read about this because he himself uh, wrote, wrote a book about uh, the trial, um, called Telling Lies About Hitler. And he, on the witness stand, day after day, point by point, refutes every one of the false charges or the negations that were um, talked about by Irving in his books. And so the ultimate um, triumph for Holocaust study and against Holocaust denial is that the British judge ruled in favor of Dr. Lipstadt and billed Irving $2 million uh, in fines for what he had done. And that really is uh, around the year 2000, the end of his denial career. However, his books still remain popular. You can still find them on Amazon and in, I think, many public libraries. 
um, what Lipstadt did for the scholarly community and quite frankly for truth and justice was incredibly amazing, particularly given the fact that he was the juggernaut coming into this, to this uh, trial and not her. Uh, Charlotte, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, this is uh, moving uh, forward from just kind of old fashioned, if I can call it that, straight Holocaust denial to much more, uh, much more involved conspiracy theory, uh, race hatred, uh, anti-Semitism generally, and denial of the Holocaust all under the guise of being pro-American, anti-communist, particularly anti-Soviet, white nationalist when that was considered a good thing in the 1950s by large segments of the American population. So the John Birch Society was founded in 1958. Uh, it was founded uh, by a man named Robert W. Welch Jr. And I won't go into what he did in particular detail beyond that, because Charlotte may touch upon that, I think. And also uh, Willis Carto and Revilo P. Oliver. And the reason I give you these names is as follows. First of all, why John Birch Society? Well, John Birch was an American intelligence officer who was murdered by Chinese communists about two weeks after the end of World War II. He was working for the OSS, uh, the precursor to the CIA. So he was an American uh, Secret Service employee. He had been sent into China to locate Japanese who had not yet surrendered and, and talk them into surrendering. Long story short, he goes into the Chinese hinterlands and he starts to run into communist uh, fighters who are fighting on behalf of Mao and the, the communist revolution that is, is making major inroads as the Japanese have, have, have lost World War II. And in one of these encounters, he's beaten and then shot to death by communist, uh, probably communist peasants, because he refuses to turn over his sidearm. What happens then is that Carto and Welch Jr. and Oliver use his name to create their society. They call him the first casualty of the Cold War. You know, it's a very, a very sexy title. And they begin to agitate against communism, against all kinds of, of race mixing and race problems. And um, Carto and Welch Jr. also begin, amongst other things, to deny the Holocaust. Uh, they're, they're extremely involved in conspiracy theory. Um, uh, Oliver in particular uh, is the one, uh, and by the way, Oliver is a university professor. You know, these are not, these are not uneducated men. Um, uh, Welch is a businessman. Anyway, Oliver wrote a uh, two-part article called Marksmanship, and that's spelled M-A-R-X-manship in Dallas, which was published in February, 1964, which as far as I know, is the first public printing of a piece that alleges that Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a communist plot. He was not operating on his own. Uh, amongst other things, uh, Oliver is a white nationalist and Oliver and Carto both, besides belonging to the Birch Society with which they both break at one point, are uh, become involved in the founding of or in the workings of the Institute for Historical Review. And now I will turn it over to Charlotte to talk about the Institute for Historical Review. Good setup? Perfect, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, I can get my PowerPoint to change too. Okay, thank you for that setup. And um, this was kind of a really necessary introduction for when we get to the Institute for Historical Review, which by the way, still exists today. Um, originally founded by uh, Cardo, uh, but also a British anti-Semite named David McCaldon. 
Um, this nonprofit was based in Los Angeles and was founded in 78. And this really made a turn for when uh, we regard the concept of Holocaust denial, because at this point, um, Holocaust deniers have still been outsiders. They've been on the fringes. And with the, in a sense, birth of this um, revisionism, which uh, historical revisionism is this concept of historians looking back on historical perspectives that have been set and taking different perspectives on it. Now, if you um, take that to the extreme, historical revisionism uh, can really easily blend into hatred or denial of um, human rights violations that have occurred, genocides that have occurred. So a lot of times when we see any kind of genocide denial uh, happening, uh, more recently we see that term revisionism being thrown out there. And that comes from this period in the late 70s, but especially in the mid 80s, this really historical revisionism really gets its birth. And the Institute for Historical Review kind of are the pioneers in this. And their efforts are to create a community and to better organize Holocaust uh, deniers so that they can be removed from their kind of isolation, from their obscurity, and basically become a new platform on which they are seen as professional academics just have a revisionist look, right, that are revisiting how we are looking at the Holocaust. Uh, really what they are doing is denying Holocaust fact, but they put it in a prettier package. And that is what the danger is of the Institute for Historical Review. And what is interesting is that for a while, this nonprofit is going to be accepted. Um, they are going to run a journal. They are going to be presenting. They, in 1979, have their own revisionist convention with speakers, and these are all Holocaust deniers, by the way, from the United States, from France, Germany, Sweden. Um, uh, they even put up these strange awards during this convention where um, they say that an award will be given for anybody who brings verifiable proof that the gas chambers used at Auschwitz were used for murder. Um, proof um, that the dive and Frank is not a fraud. Uh, basically saying um, every proof that has been, every evidence that exists out there so far is false. And so unless you can bring us proof, uh, we are going to deny that this has happened. And so this is really important to understand. And what I wanted to share here is this is actually a, a screenshot that I took um, literally three days ago from the Institute for Historical for Review from their website, where it lists still their mission. Um, and if you go to this website, it looks really professional, like you're on this kind of historical news site. And if you read, you know, they have a board, they have the mission, everything is very, very professionally laid out. But then if you really start reading it, you immediately can see that Holocaust denial uh, seeping in. So I'm going to just read this really quick. The Institute for Historical Review is an independent educational center, right? Again, that stress that they are um, this valid organization and publisher that works to promote peace and understanding and justice through greater public awareness of the past, especially socially political relevant aspects of modern history. We strive in particular to increase understanding of the causes, nature, consequences of war and conflict. We defend freedom of speech and freedom of historical inquiry. Uh, we work to provide factual information and sound uh, perspectives on U.S. foreign policy, World War II, the Israel-Palestine conflict, war propaganda, Middle East history, the, and there is where we really get to it, right? The Jewish Zionist role in cultural and political life and much more. If you then start opening these historical articles, what you'll see is, um, you know, for example, there is an encyclopedic um, article on the gas chambers. And the first paragraph, it's almost like it's coming from Wikipedia, explains all about the gas chambers at Auschwitz. And then the second paragraph in, um, it starts 
arguing that these gas chambers didn't exist, that even if they did exist, that that wouldn't have fit that many Jews in there. It, it, it starts addressing the numbers and on and on and on. So the danger that comes with that is that, you know, our, that people Google, say, Auschwitz gas chambers, and that these institutions, these organizations pop up or that you pick up a journal and it's the journal for historical review from this organization. And that people that are not aware think that these are actual historical scholars, um, especially people who are not trained in history. And that makes it, it makes them very dangerous. And that shift in Holocaust denial um, really, in a sense, uh, radicalized Holocaust denial as well, but also in a, professionalized it. In the mid-1980s, another element added to it that uh, at this point, Cardo um, had left the Institute for Historical Review actually um, through um, quite a little dispute with them as well. And the new president or head for the IHR became Mark Weber, uh, who actually was a, a leader in the national vanguard, this kind of extreme white nationalist movement, and came from a very strong neo-Nazi background. And that added to that layer of really that focus on solely Holocaust denial and, and focusing on that and that extremism. Today, um, today the international um, uh, sorry, the Institute for Hysterical Review still exists. It is on the decline, which is great. Um, and I just saw somebody um, um, put a question in the Q&A about the role of social media and Google. And I have to say the reason that uh, this organization in particular is on the decline is because of social media giants and Google fighting this. That has only happened in the very recent years. I remember when I started at the very beginning as an education coordinator at the museum and I would go to professional development and I would teach uh, basically other teachers about the dangers of Holocaust denial and how that could seep into their curriculum. And I would give the Institute for Historical Review as an example, because what I would make them do as an activity is just open any browser, Google, back then it was Yahoo, was like one of the common browsers, and just type in Auschwitz gas chambers. And every single time, if I did this in like 2012, 13, 14, the IHR was the first article on the gas chambers to pop up. If you do that today, it won't even pop up in a Google browser anymore uh, in a search tool. And Facebook also is continuously making sure that um, these types of organizations um, are, are, are either banned or um, do not have a voice anymore on these platforms. The result is that, that um, they are not able to publish anymore and it really limits it. So, um, so we have seen a dramatic de decline on that. And um, that requires these organizations to find different routes, uh, right? To find their voice to, to, to link. And that actually brings me to state-sponsored Holocaust denial. Um, because so far we've talked about individuals, we've talked about organizations, uh, but let's now turn to states that sponsor denial. And I'm gonna talk about Iran because it is kind of in a sense the poster child for Holocaust denial and state-sponsored denial. But I do want to make clear that Iran is not the only one. Like we can look at Egypt, um, you know, I, I um, always remember that famous quote from uh, President Nasser in 1964, where he said, no person, not even uh, the most simple one, takes seriously the lie of the 6 million Jews that were murdered, right? We see uh, state-sponsored um, Holocaust denial from Qatar to Saudi Arabia. Turkey, where just, you know, in 96, did this um, booklet called Sokirim uh, Yalani, the genocide lie was published and, and is frequently spread. It's even, you know, televised sometimes. Um, 
and then even in Europe, right? Especially in the in the in the last decade, we've seen um, this Holocaust denial in, in their role and participation. You know, from Hungary denying that the error cross was in some cases even bad, or or, or participated in the murder of the Jews, or uh, ignoring that President Tiso in Slovakia was uh, part of the deportations of of the Jews, and in the Ukraine, we're seeing these celebrations of these national heroes that were leaders of Nazi parties or uh, Nazi allies during the Holocaust, such as Stefan ben, uh, Bendera. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Europe um, and Holocaust distortion and how that's kind of expanded. But I want to look for state-sponsored um, denial really specifically at Iran. And Iran is, like I said, the post a poster child for this. First, because it's so ingrained in their leadership. If we go back all the way to the early uh, 2000s, and I, I apologize, I always have the most difficult time pronouncing his name, but when we look at former President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, made it through, um, uh, you know, continuously since the early um, 2000s, we have in, in repeated speeches him questioning um, uh, historical evidence regarding the Holocaust. For example, in 2005, um, probably in, in one of the more famous speeches, he said that they, the Jews, right, have fabricated a legend under the name of the massacre of the Jews, the Holocaust, right? And they hold it higher than God himself, religion itself, and the prophets themselves. If somebody in the country questions God, nobody says anything, but if somebody denies the myth of the massacre of the Jews, or if somebody denies the Holocaust, the Zionist loudspeaker and the governments in pay of Zionism, the West, uh, will start to scream. And, um, and so this is uh, what we see with this state-sponsored uh, denial in Iran, uh, is that it, it becomes linked to Israel, that the reason um, the West looks at the Holocaust is to validate Israel. And for no other reason that really there was no Holocaust, it is just needed to give validity to Israel. Uh, and that continues, right? We, we see Pre President uh, Rouhani in 2013 repeating the same things. Uh, the Supreme Leader, the Ayatollah, in 2014, literally on his own website, um, is questioning that the mass murder of the Jews even happened. He, in 2016, released this video called Holocaust, Are the Dark Ages Over? Question mark, in which he said, no one in European countries dares to speak out about the Holocaust, while it is not clear whether the core of this matter is clear or not. Even if it's a reality, it is not clear how it happened. Speaking about the Holocaust and expressing doubts about it is considered to be a great sin. If someone does this, they stop, arrest, imprison, and sue him. This is while they claim to be the supporters of freedom. This is the ignorance that exists in today's world. And so what we see here is really this linking of um, that of uh, freedom of speech, that this is this Western concept, and that it's there only to uphold um, this, this lie of the Holocaust. And um, with um, this, this, this leadership picking this on, um, different institutions are formed to continuously push forward and to really bring, you know, as we saw with the IHR, this kind of um, Holocaust denial community in the US, you know, organizes, this becomes the, the world kind of formation of a group of deniers, right? In 2006 in Tehran, the International Conference to Review the Global Vision of the Holocaust. Did you hear that word review in there again? Again, that linking to revisionism, right? This isn't just us um, um, uh, being hateful. This is we're actually studying historical fact. Uh, but in this, in essence, it's a Holocaust denial conference was uh, was held, which uh, really was a two day conference uh, where participants, um, mainly Holocaust deniers from across the world were flown in. Uh, they included folks such as David Duke, 
former Klan member, uh, Robert Forreston, convicted Holocaust denier in France, Ahmed Rami, uh, convicted um, a Swede um, who was uh, imprisoned for several years for inciting hatred, and Frederick Tobin, who is Australian, Austrian, whatever he sees himself that day, um, um, a Holocaust denier, who during the conference labeled Holocaust education as mental rape just to kind of give you an idea of how, uh, you know, what uh, the focus of this conference was. Paper topics included um, a challenge to the official Holocaust story and on and on and on. Of course, this had some backlash from the rest of the world, especially the West, uh, to the point that the um, foreign minister of Iran um, had to speak up about it and uh, made the claim to against the objections of the conference that the Holocaust is not a sacred issue that one can't touch. I have visited the Nazi camps and I think this is an exaggeration. They are an exaggeration. So um, uh, this led of course to the famous, and as you can see on uh, my uh, PowerPoint right here as well, uh, cartoon, Holocaust denial cartoon. Uh, contest. Uh, starting in 2006 uh, was a combined contest of the Iranian newspaper Ham Shari uh, um, and the Iran Cartoon Organization, which by the way still exists today. And if you are interested in um, learning more about their competitions, you can find more about on irancartoon.com. Um, but uh, the uh, Hamshari's uh, chief um, editor said that the purpose of establishing this competition is not to offend or ridicule anybody, but to do a discussions about the realities of the Holocaust. Um, uh, basically, the 12 best cartoonists were then offered uh, the prize of a golden coin, which actually by the time the contest ended was expanded to prize money between five and $12,000. The uh, competition in 2006 was, was won by uh, um, a Moroccan cartoonist um, who, uh, as you can see here, uh, depicts this Israeli crane erecting uh, a wall around, um, uh, 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 in a sense, Temple Mount and, and, and separating um, um, uh, Israel away from it um, and, and, and building in it since a concentration camp around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, uh, be Auschwitz around it, um, uh, with it. And, and in, um, you can go online and search all of the other cartoons as well, the other 12 best ones, but this, this was the winner. Um, subsequent cartoon contest has followed this. In 2012, in reaction to the shootings at Charlie Hebdo, uh, the cartoon contest returned again. There were over 860 submissions from across the world from over 50 countries. The winner was French on purpose because it was a reaction to Charlie Hebdo. Um, the second place uh, went to cartoonists from Indonesia and Belgium. Uh, recently, the third contest ended in 2020 just to give you an idea. And I think there is a fourth contest in uh, the works as well. So this is a project that is continuously moving forward. Um, and uh, the focus is definitely becoming anti-Zionist and tying that anti-Zionism to Holocaust denial as much as possible. Um, I want to move forward it, keeping the topic of state sponsored, but shifting it from Holocaust denial a little bit to Holocaust distortion. And before I, I go into the example of Poland, um, I want to explain that Holocaust distortion is distortion of the Holocaust, um, sorry, distortion of the Holocaust is rhetoric, written work, or media that excuses minimizes or misrepresents the known historical record. This can be intentional or unintentional. And Sarah is gonna uh, give some examples where it wasn't meant um, intentional, but they are still uh, practicing forms of Holocaust distortion. However, all distortion, whether intentional or not, feeds into the anti-Semitic narrative and Holocaust denial narrative and can lead to violent forms of anti-Semitism. 
and reactions there against. And that's something that definitely the escalation of that that we've seen in Poland. Forms of distortion, just like Sarah gave forms of Holocaust denial, uh, include intentional efforts to excuse or minimize the Holocaust, including the role played by collaborators and allies of Nazi Germany, a minimization of the numbers and the victims, blaming Jews for the Holocaust, which can also be more fall into Holocaust denial, casting the Holocaust as a positive historical event, um, and attempting to blur the responsibilities for the crimes of the Holocaust. And that is really what we are seeing happening in, um, in uh, I would say, the last decade in Poland very strongly. In 2018, Poland passed the amendment to act on the Institute of National Remembrance. Basically, this is a complicity law that states that it will crim that it criminalizes those publicly accusing the Polish nation or state of complicity in the Holocaust. So if you write something or you publicly say something that blames the Polish state of uh, participating in the Holocaust, you basically are um, put on trial and, this, and there are penalties for this. And, and think about this, this can be something as simple as exhibits uh, uh, saying um, the Holocaust happened in Poland, or this was a Polish concentration camp, rather than saying this is a um, um, concentration camp in German occupied Poland. And that is to the extent where this goes and where the Polish state um, uh, plays a role in this. Of course, this all came kind of together. As you can see on the picture here, Dr. Grabowski and Dr. Engel King right here, who uh, were uh, uh, by several NGO, Polish NGOs brought um, on defamation trial uh, for defamation against the Polish state and uh, Polish citizens. Uh, eventually, they were found guilty by the court and ordered to apologize. This was all because one tiny little line in their edited volume and collections called Night Without an End, where a pre-war Polish mayor uh, was allegedly called out um, by them for participating in the murder and um, them um, referencing and questioning the testimony in that case. Um, and so this this has huge implications. It's, it is become makes it very difficult for um, Holocaust historians to point out any participation of Poles or the Polish state within um, uh, the Holocaust, and it literally whitewashes, right, any role there within. On top of that, the Polish state is continuously trying to recast Poland in a positive light, and I, I put the Polityki Institute on here, which is a does amazing work as well, but especially more recently as a, as a government institute as well has been starting projects that are really highlighting that and almost making it seem that all Poles were rescuers, right? And that it had, uh, that uh, there was hardly any perpetrators. Uh, one of these projects is called by name where they're over and over and over emphasizing all uh, the rescuers um, and, and stressing that and almost highlighting uh, no other examples. And, um, and so that's, we, we are seeing that more is almost this, this glorification of the Polish hero during the Holocaust and um, allowing no other conversation in it. Um, and, and so this is, um, brings it back. And so I wanted to bring it and wrap it up for my end before I turn it back over to Sarah to really briefly end with that Holocaust distortion Nile um, here in the US, because uh, more recently there have been incidents and then I'm thinking here of Robert Keith Parker, um, who publicly wore um, that Camp Auschwitz um, uh, sweater hoodie uh, on January 6th at the US Capitol building. And, um, and, and everybody was, sh you know, a lot of people were shocked to see this. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, people who saw all the slogans at Charlottesville too, um, and, and saw this as this new white uh, nationalist, white supremacy movement that was all of a sudden popping up and uh, became part, uh, you know, was 
uh, almost reinventing Holocaust denial. And what is really important to realize, and I think that's the path that Sarah and I wanted to lay out, is that there is this roadmap that this is ingrained this is part of society it's always been there now it's just you know becoming our face because it's on tv and social media but it's always been there david duke throughout this right he's in iran he's part of the institute for historical review over and over again mark weber is at all of these different different ties in as well um and this has been feeding in and in and and that is really important that when we um, get these events um, that become a national focus, um, that it shocks people, but that um, this is part, Holocaust denial is always been a core, a root of neo-Nazism in the United States and white supremacy extremism. And so that's kind of where I want to wrap it up with and turn it back to Sarah. Okay. Um... So I uh, will will wrap it up here, but I wanted to answer uh, one of the questions that came through from somebody who has uh, uh, joined us this evening. Um, the question is, do you think QAnon and its reliance on blood libel is the next form of Holocaust denial? Uh, it's an excellent question. And it is not, in fact, a form of Holocaust denial. What it is, is a, is a rebadging of some of the um, cultish um, conspiracy theories that the Nazis certainly used, um, but it really is a um, bringing into the, the present of a libel against Jews that goes back at least to, to the European Middle Ages. But again, packaged in a, in a prettier package, you know, we're talking about a deep state, we're talking about child prostitution and pornography rings, and the Jews run it all and they run our government too, and they're still involved in blood libel. Um, it really is a mixing of some of the ancient or the older anti-Judaism um, uh, theories and, and lies with newer anti-Semitic conspiracies both of which played well in Nazi Germany, but this in and of itself is not, is not a, a particular form of Holocaust denial. It's a form of anti-Semitism. That's a good question. So uh, what we have here are um, uh, two pictures of uh, current politicians in the United States. On the left is Marjorie Taylor Greene. On the right is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Both of these women have used the Holocaust and, and in many ways cheapening what happened to six million Jews and, and millions of others, you know, the Jews who were marked for extermination, millions of others who suffered Nazi persecution, and they cheapen, cheapen this experience to make political points. On the left, as I said, we have Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is using Nazi iconography, uh, the yellow badging of Jews, to compare the, the efforts to get people in the United States vaccinated to state-sponsored singling out of Jews across international borders and marking them for murder. It, it's, it's, it's not just an absurdity, it's an obscenity. Um, she did visit uh, at the urging of, of a number of uh, Jewish leaders and also people in Congress. She visited the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC and came out saying, you know, I understand now that what I did was wrong and the Holocaust, you know, is, is a terrible event, but she continues to periodically pipe, pipe up with these, these kinds of absurdities. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is known for her just folks, you know, all just folks kind of Instagram uh, presentations where she'll be cooking in her kitchen, you know, without her makeup on. She's just like the rest of us. Um, this particular, and, and talking about her political views on things, this particular picture uh, was from a live stream event on Instagram uh, under the 
previous administration or the Trump administration in which she compared the annihilation of 6 million Jews in, in concentration camps and, and death camps to the detention centers. So she was comparing those concentration camps to detention centers run by the, the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, Service on our, on our southern border. And she said, and I quote, the US is running concentration camps on our southern border, and that is exactly what they are. You know, and then she went on to, to give you a sense that she knew what she was doing. She went on to declare, never again, we cannot allow genocide on our southern border to unfold. And no matter what you think about US immigration policy, detention, um, whether we should be letting people in, whether she, we should not be letting people in, the that's really not the issue here here what she is doing is she is she is talking about the mass murder of six million jews under cover of war across international borders and driven by state actors and comparing it to to a citizenship uh, policy uh, on our on our borders, and it's it's just an absurdity. It's just it's a bad bad comparison that she's made, and so my point is that even these politicians are not above or beneath, depending on how you look at it, using the Holocaust as as we we label here for political gain. In other words, everybody knows on some level those who are paying attention that this had powerful, powerful um, ramifications for the world uh, in the post-1945 uh, period. And so when they want to make their point about something that they think is particularly egregious, that is their go-to historical example. Uh, and it has no connection to anything. Uh, as far as that goes. So we're almost out of town, time, excuse me, there is a uh, question here, um, which I think is an excellent question. Do you want, I'll read it, Charlotte, do you wanna take a whack at it or would you like me to? It's what are some common motives for denying the Holocaust? So that's a very good question. You know, what do people gain or hope to gain by doing this, why do it? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, um, Sarah referred earlier to the 10 stages of genocide. And, and so I wanted to bring it back to there. It's kind of bring it at full circle here is that that is it a key part. It's, it's almost a one uh, with straight out denial. It is often a continuation of the genocide, right? Re-victimizing, um, re-dehumanizing the victims, continuing that, right? Is blaming them for everything. It is that continuation. Um, and, and Dr. Stanton always says it's, it's, it's actually a great indicator that that hatred is continuing and that um, genocide is possible again in the future uh, with that as well. So um, denial can be a really big factor that needs to be watched. Um, and, and I think that is it, right? It is, a, it is that continued anti-Semitism as well, that um, it is, um, again, a group um, to easily blame and to feed into that anti-Semitism that it still exists uh, today. So, um, so I think that is, um, in a sense, the benefit that comes with it for um, many um, uh, deniers with it. Sarah, did you want to add something additional? To no, that? I, I think that that really covers it. Um, I, I also think part of it is that Holocaust denial is part of a, a longer, uh, very complex and involved history of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, uh, which began in the West, moved into the Arab world when the West came in under the French and others as colonizers, you know, but it, it, it's definitely a Western a Western initiated creation that then gets spread around. Um, and all of these things as, as part of this larger uh, uh, anti-Semitism uh, have explanatory power for people as to why they can't control things in their lives, in society, why things go wrong, why bad things happen to good people. And it's because there is this sinister force beyond our control that is making these things happen. That is the wire pullers 
of the puppets and we are the puppets in society and that sinister force would be the Jews. Um, it has incredible and remarkable explanatory power and staying power and, and I think that that's what, what really helps to account for this. Okay, uh, we are at eight on the dot. Annie, would you like to take us out? Very well timed. Thank you as always, Sarah and Charlotte. Um, for being with us tonight and sharing that information. I did want to mention just kind of, I know we were talking about anti-Semitism. We have the last session of our Crucial Conversation series on confronting anti-Semitism coming up on Thursday, August 5th. This one will be particularly about combating anti-Semitism. So if you're interested in hearing a little bit more on some of the topics we touched on tonight, um, we hope you'll join us for that. You can register on our website. But thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you next time.